Hello and welcome to Bike Radar Builds, the video series in which we bring you, our beloved, beautiful YouTube audience, an overview of the bikes that we are riding, many of which have become a test bed for exciting new cycling tech. Today, to say the least, we have quite an eclectic mix of bikes. Kicking things off, we'll be looking at Alex's Marin Alpine Trail XR, which has been modified to give more travel than the factory spec. Next, we'll be taking a throwback to the past and looking at Max's Peugeot Hurricane, a retro mountain bike that he's been getting up to all sorts of nonsense on over the past year. Finally, we will be seeing my beloved tandem Cecil, my favourite bike of all time, who has had a significant refurbishment since you last saw him way back in 2018. However, we've got a little bit of a change, and this time around, Bike Radar Builds isn't just about our sensational swag. We want you to send us your coolest custom builds, and all you have to do is share a photo of your bike on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram with the hashtag Bike Radar Builds. Now, if today's rundown isn't quite enough for you, be sure to check out our original episode of Bike Radar Builds with a link to that in the video description. And of course, as always, don't forget to like and subscribe and slap that little bell icon so every time we upload a video like this, you'll get a notification. Behind me is my Marin Alpine Trail XR bike radar build custom bike. Now, I've built this bike up from scratch using a host of different parts that I've either tested or am currently testing and it is a real mishmash of specs. However, like a lot of my bikes, there are some themes that run through with some go-to components that I always end up using. On this particular bike, you can see I fitted Fabrics Fungi Grips. Now I find these super tacky and really comfortable out on the trails. I absolutely love them. And on all of the bikes that I test, I end up fitting these grips. Next up is 1UP Components version 2 dropper post. I've reviewed this dropper post in the past and awarded it 5 out of 5 stars. And that's because it offers the maximum amount of travel for the minimum amount of possible stack height. Now in layman terms, that means that you can set your seat as low as it can go whilst also raising it right up to the top without having to manually adjust the post in the frame. Although I have been testing Shimano's Dior four piston brakes on this bike, I do always end up going back to a firm favorite, which is SRAM's Guide G2 brakes. Now these, in my opinion, seem to offer a great balance between weight, performance, and feel. That's not to say that other brakes are bad, I just really like these ones. I'm currently testing lots and lots of drivetrains and group sets. So this bike did used to have Shimano's M6100 Dior 12 speed. However, I've now taken that off and have fitted Microshift's Advent X system to test that one. The Advent X is a 10 speed drivetrain with a 48 tooth largest cassette sprocket. Because it's a 10 speed, the chain width is slightly wider and the spacing between each cassette sprocket is slightly bigger. Now this should mean, in theory, that shifting is more reliable and the chain is less likely to snap. I've only just fitted this, so keep tuned to Bike Radar and MBUK for a full review. Unlike the factory build of the Alpine Trail XR that comes with a RockShox Super Deluxe Ultimate Rear Shock, I've got Fox's DHX2 coil sprung shock fitted to this bike. This factory version of the X2 has both high and low speed compression and rebound adjustment. The shocks also got a climb lever. Now this means that it's super adjustable and you can flick the climb lever on for when you're heading uphill to help reduce suspension bob. Now the eagle-eyed amongst you may notice that I've routed the brake and gear cables externally on this bike even though the frame has internal routing. Now, there's a few reasons for this. The first one and most sensible is because I'm swapping drivetrains, gear cables, and brakes around quite a lot, thanks to my testing job. 
Now, some of you may know me and know my preferences for a minimum amount of faff possible. For me, routing cables internally through any frame is a nightmare, I cannot stand it. And for that reason, you'll find most of my bikes will have externally routed cables. This one, no exception. You might also notice the steerer tube above the stem. Now, these forks were in our recent forks group test, and I've managed to borrow them for a little while to test on this bike. And I didn't want to cut the steerer tube down because I like having the ability to change bar height depending on what I'm doing, what I'm riding, and what I'm testing. Now, this particular fork is a 170 mil travel version, and the stock Alpine Trail XR comes with a 160 mil travel version, which is why I've slammed the stem right the way down on the steer tube. I've also recently completed a tires mega test group test. Now, not every tire from every manufacturer was in that test, but there were some real key performers in there. Most notably for me is the Schwalbe Magic Mary. I absolutely love the Magic Mary in every way on pretty much every terrain. And because of that, I awarded it five stars. And that's why it's now on my personal bike. The Alpine Trail XR has a 63.5 degree head angle and a 78 degree seat tube angle. Now this means on the descents, it's gonna be really calm and composed thanks to that slack head tube angle. And on the climbs, it's gonna make my hips further over the front and the center of the bike, rather than having a slack angle and bringing your hips rearward, which makes climbing more comfortable and much easier. The size large that I ride here, I'm 178 centimeters tall by the way, has a 480 millimeter reach. It also has a 1,256 millimeter long wheelbase. I find these numbers combine to give a lovely stable feeling ride. And the Alpine Trail is a true monster on the descent. One of my proudest purchases during 2020 was this retro beast, which is a Peugeot Hurricane from the early 90s. Bought for 150 pounds on Facebook Marketplace, this bike makes me smile every time I look at it without fail. Its paint job is amazing and it really gives you that 80s disco vibe. It's also a very fun bike to throw cheap upgrades at to give it that more modern twist. And brace yourselves for a potentially unpopular opinion, could almost be comparable to a modern day flat bar gravel bike. The bare bones of this French Fancy includes a Reynolds 531 steel frame, a Tanguay chromoly steel fork, Mavic oxygen wheels with a Continental Mountain King 2.2 on the front and a Schwabel Mountaineer 1.9 on the rear. And a good old fashioned Shimano X-Sage 500LX 3x7 group set. When I picked up the bike, I was amazed to see how immaculate the condition was. The frame had barely any marks or blemishes on it, and all the moving parts were well greased and working properly. And the first thought I had when driving it home was, how can I put a modern twist on this retro classic to stop it from becoming more than just a collector's item? I thought I'd start with the tyres, you know, to beef them up and give them a bit more extra comfort and grip on the ride. So I bought a pair of 2.25 Schwalbe tyres, a knobby nick up the front for maximum grip in corners, and a rocket run for the back for faster rolling. I also changed the brake and gear shifters to a newer Shimano brake and gear shifter 3x7 setup. This is because the old one that came with the bike was really hard to push and had quite sort of sharp edges on it. It also meant I lost the classically long cantilever levers, which didn't bother me too much anyway, because cantilever's crap, and I don't really intend on stopping that much anyway. Lastly, and this was probably one of the most fun upgrades, I bought myself a relatively cheap seat actuated dropper post. You could say a dropper post doesn't belong on a bike like this, and you'd be right, but I wanted to make this bike feel as versatile as possible, and after scouring the internet, I struggled to find a size that would fit the seat tube of the bike. 
Eventually, I settled on an Amazon special that I found, roughly for around £50, again, not wanting to spend too much money on upgrades. The dropper had 110mm of drop and the post was about 27.2mm wide, which was the narrowest I could find. Now the inside of the seat tube in the frame was about 27 to 27 27.1mm wide. So I knew there was going to be a bit of bodging to get this post to fit. Once the post finally arrived, I took it to my dad as he has a lathe in his garage. So I asked him to turn it down by about 1 to 1.5 millimetres. After that, we applied a generous amount of grease and the post slid all the way into the frame. No problem. Here's what I have to say, I probably wouldn't recommend this at home. It's not a great idea to take a brand new dropper post and start chipping away at it with the machine. The only reason I got my dad to do it is because he's an engineer and I trust that he knows what he's doing. While a dropper isn't overly necessary for a bike like this, I do still find that I use it quite a lot because every millimetre of drop counts when you're on those descents. I use the bike for more cross country and gravel oriented rides and less sort of technical steep stuff, although that can be quite fun too. It also works great for quick blasts around my local trail and those new plush tires mean that I can run them at slightly lower pressures which makes them great for running over those sort of fingery, rooty sort of type trails. I must say that the old style Shimano Biopace oval chainring was a bit hard to get on with at first, as the hardest part of the stroke happens when your feet are horizontal, and this makes it really hard when you're trying to put the hammer down. I did think about changing it, but after a few rides, I kind of got used to it, and it's a nice novel nod to the past, and it's very in keeping with the start of the bike that it is. The best ride I've had on it to date was a 54 kilometer cross country loop as part of the South Downs Way from Butzer Hill to Winchester and back. I did this ride with fully laden pannier bags and honestly, it felt like trying to pedal an e-bike with a flat battery. Not to mention it was extremely boggy and I even had to get off and walk in a few places as it was so unrideable. Nevertheless, I took my time and I enjoyed a very, very crazy ride around England's southern countryside. I plan to do more long distance riding and possibly even some bike packing on this bike in the future. A small group of us have planned to do a retro ride from Winchester to Eastbourne on the South Downs Way, which is 100 miles when COVID eases. If you'd like to see a video of that, let us know in the comments. From one retro bike, to another, we have Cecil, my beloved Vintage Orbit Touring Tandem, which is also quite possibly the bike we've featured the most on this YouTube channel. Now, the first time you all got to meet Cecil was way back in 2018, when I did a challenge with Ruben and Joe Dearly Departed, where we tried to take a local KOM on the bike as it was built then. Since then, I've made some pretty significant modifications to better suit the more go slow touring intentions that Laura and I have for this bike. Now, the most notable change is switching from drop bar to a more upright cockpit. And on the front, we have a Nito Albatross bar for the pilot or captain, as you called on the front of the tandem. And Laura has a slightly more swept back bar, again from Nito, in the stoker's position. The drop bars were fine on Cecil, but realistically, we actually used the drops so infrequently that they were kind of redundant. And really, what I want is a lovely, upright riding position where I can wave at our adoring fans as we go by. And this new cockpit really gets me into that position. The overall fit was also a little bit long with the drop bars. So with that basically negative reach on the Albatross bars, I am lovely and upright. The next most significant upgrade is to the drivetrain, where I switched from a 56 tooth outer chain ring, which we never used on this bike, down to a much more manageable, touring friendly gearing. Instead, we now have a 24 tooth inner chain ring, a 34 tooth middle chain ring, and a 44 tooth outer. And that is paired at the back with an 11 to 36 cassette. If you think a 24, 36 gear sounds outrageously low, you are correct but you have clearly never ridden a tandem before. This thing is outrageously slow to climb on. It doesn't matter how strong a team you have, it is bizarre trying to climb on a tandem. It flex and whips like a piece of wet spaghetti, 
and just sitting back and spinning at a billion RPM is the only way. I also totally replaced the timing drivetrain, and that's the one on the non-drive side which connects my cranks to Laura's. Most tandems use an eccentric bottom bracket to tension the timing drivetrain, and Cecil's no different. The difference here was that for some unbeknownst reason, it uses a totally non-standard size. So I ended up having to call on the father of one of my colleagues who turned me a shim to fit the original eccentric BB to fit the shell. This is so true of nearly everything with tandems. Nothing is normal and finding parts is a total nightmare. I'm so glad I've put the effort into the drivetrain though because the whole thing runs smoother than it ever did before. As one fun little final point, there is so much flex inside this frame that I've thus far been unable to make the gears work indexed. Essentially what that means is that on the right hand side shifter, which controls the rear gears, I'm running it in friction shifting mode. And I just have to kind of dial it in to the point where it doesn't skip wildly up and down the cassette whenever we stand up to climb. The wheel set is also totally brand new. I built this myself with a set of DCR 40 hole hubs with matching Sunringle Rhino Light rims. On the rear, we also see an ARRI drum brake, which I sent off to get refurbished. This uses basically glued on brake shoes, which have to be cooked in an oven or something. It's not the sort of thing you can do at home. So I had to send it to a nice man in Sheffield to do it for me. I think it's the heaviest wheel set I've ever handled in my life. I think it weighs something like four and a half, five kilos for both of them with the drum brake fitted, admittedly, uh, which given we feature bikes which weigh that, gives you an indication of just how much this bad boy weighs. By far the best accessory I've ever bought in my life, ever in cycling, was a kickstand for this bike. It's a big, dorky, twin leg Pletcher kickstand, and I have no idea how we lived without it before. Trying to pick up a fully loaded tandem is incredibly hard, and I would rather not get a hernia on a cycle tour. The highlight of my 2021 so far has been riding this just over stupid, grimy, gravelly lanes with Laura and eating cheese and coleslaw sandwiches in the woods. I did all this work in 2020 because we were planning on doing a ridiculous three-week tour around our home in Scotland, but no surprises, that was canceled. In any case, I've put all this effort in Cecil is running better than he ever has before, and I hope so much that we get to do our big tour finally this year. I know it's hard to believe, but that's only a small overview of everything I've changed on this bike. And I actually wrote a really in-depth piece looking at all the changes on bikeradar.com. If you are a tandem nerd like Laura and I, you'll love it. Thus concludes our overview of some pretty interesting builds, and we'd love to hear what you think about them and our spec choices. Leave those thoughts in the comments and any questions you have as well. Again, our heart bursts at the mere thought of seeing the beautiful bikes you are all riding, so please do share a photo of your bike on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the hashtag BikeRadarBuilds, and you might be featured in the next episode. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and click that little bell icon. Whew! <laughs>